approved for next year. And we'll talk more about next year here in just a little bit. I'm also going to announce to you that the last drawing in the exhibit hall will be at 1.15, which is just as soon as we are finished here. And uh, our new chairperson that I'll introduce in just a little bit is going to say it again. Because I understand we need to say it, say it, and say it again so that it sticks. <laughs> so anyway, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. He is Hans Meter. He is president of the Meter Consulting Group a firm that offers analysis of education and workforce policy, strategic visioning and implementation planning, and research on promising and proven practices. Hans is also a member of the National Advisory Board for the Ford Partnership for the Advanced Studies and the Executive Director of the Institute for 21st Century Leadership, a leadership development project jointly sponsored by the International Center for Leadership and Education, the Successful Practices Network, and the Association for Career and Technical Education. Meter has an extensive and varied background in educational policy. He has served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Education in the U.S. Department of Education Office of Vocational and Adult Education, Policy and Outreach Director for the House of Representatives Committee on Education and the Workforce, Senior Vice President for Force Workforce and Post-Secondary Education at the National Alliance of Business and Ed Executive Director of the 21st Century Workforce Commission. His areas of expertise include, expertise include high school reform, career technical education, community colleges and organizational leadership. Meter earned his BA from the University of Maryland College Park and holds an MBA from the University of Maryland uh, College. And without further ado, would you come up, Hans? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Hope you enjoy the rest of your meal and uh, listen in a little bit here. I'm really excited to be here, and I want to thank you for the chance to share with you. How many of you? Uh, have a favorite superhero from childhood. Come on, guys, lift up the hands. I don't know if women are into superheroes the way guys are, um, <clears throat> but I had a favorite, and here he is, Superman. Superman. So he was, uh, from age probably five until about age 12, uh, he was the, the guy that I really wanted to be. Um, and then I found at some point that the job was already filled. There wasn't really a role for another Superman. But I think I still, into my adulthood, took a little bit of a Superman complex with me. Because basically, in every situation, uh, I tend to think, OK, well, what do I have to do to save the world? And my wife and I have a running joke about this when I come home from, uh, from my work or from a trip. And I might be a little tired or something, and we joke about it. It's really hard when you have to be the one to save the world. How many of you in this room feel like that's your job, to save the world? There we go. <laughs> I had the feeling that among a lot of educators, people are trying to do innovative things, that you might have a sense that, of responsibility for making the world a better place. And the reality is that saving the world sometimes is a little bit of a lonely job. Uh, we, can, uh, we can get out there and feel like you know, we're, we're the only one in our organization that might actually care about changing things and improving things. But today I'm going to talk about uh, a number of the big questions. One of the things that heroes face, uh, any good hero story, whether it's a you know, house uh, solving some medical mystery or it's a superhero, it's a superhero fighting the evil villain, uh, there, there's, you don't win by brute force. You win by understanding uh, that, that secret weakness of the thing that you're fighting against. And often a lot of the plot line is, is figuring out what you're fighting against and what the situation really is, and then designing or, or coming up with the, with the action steps to, to save the world. These are some so these things are that I wonder about. Uh, as I'm thinking about how to connect education with the innovation economy, some of the things I wonder about is why didn't that massive government stimulus actually create more jobs? 
It saved some jobs. It created some road construction jobs. And there may be some jobs that are going to come forward out of all that stimulus money. Another thing I wonder about uh, is will holding the line on new government taxes, uh, uh, getting, go getting government out of the way, which I heard uh, one member of Congress talk about the last day or two, will that actually create new jobs? And then what role should educators play when the future of America is fairly murky? Um, I came from the beast, spent several years working in, inside Washington in, the, in Congress as a staff member at the US Department of Education. Uh, sometimes it's pretty disturbing to see the level of discourse and the simplicity of discourse. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Uh, if we think about that, who's, uh, are you smarter than a fifth grader? Uh, I guess we could you know, turn that around. Are you smarter than your, con your congressman? Are you, smarter than, are you smarter than your U.S. senator? And I'd say in the next 25, 30 minutes, you will be smarter than your congressman. You will be smarter because you're going to learn some things that are the real issues about why we're having this jobless recovery. Things that, for me, have really opened my eyes and been very helpful to understanding. Uh, so that, And I think for you, in leading your work, at the regional level, at the local level, you're going to be able to answer some questions and help frame the work you're doing in a way that perhaps you, you haven't been able to do in the past. So we're going to look and, and develop a deeper understanding of what is the innovation ecosystem and how that affects job creation, uh, get a handle on the skills that employers really care about, uh, see some bright spots, some things that are actually working, uh, positive developments that are happening, and then I'm going to challenge you with some action steps. Actually, I better take my, put my watch here. Okay, good, I know. Good. I have a clock right here, so I know what my time frame is. Okay, so first challenge, understanding the uh, innovation ecosystem. And uh, the real uh, qu quandary is why are we having this recovery where we're officially in a recovery, but we're still dealing with staggering unemployment for Amer by, by America's standards. I know that many of these numbers are going to be too, much, be too much for you to read, so I'm just going to generally summarize. Uh, the organization is, will put this uh, presentation on their website and make it available to you, so you'll be able to get all the documentation uh, afterward. But basically, we're at about a 9.5%, maybe 9.2% unemployment rate. Uh, lost 8.6 8. million jobs. But this is the really interesting thing. At the end of last year, American companies had 800, over $800 billion cash on hand, enough to pay uh, the salaries of 2.4 million people for five years. So th there is money. It isn't like our, our American companies are starving for cash. cash. But 950,000 jobs were created last year, 750,000 jobs so far in this year. That is barely enough to keep pace just with, with uh, the, the population, normal population growth. It is not anywhere near enough to actually decrease the unemployment rate. So we've got about 13 and a half million people that are still unemployed. Why so few jobs actually created here in the U.S.? So the first thing is really important is to think about the impact of startup companies on job creation. Uh, there's, a uh, there's a throwaway line that, you know, small businesses are the answer. Small businesses, yes, but there's been a new analysis of workforce data that indicates that it's young companies, companies that are six, six old years or old. younger, that actually create all the jobs. Existing companies... Uh, over the long haul are actually losing jobs every year. And it's the new young companies that are actually creating the new jobs. So it's not just small business in general, it's those younger companies. Uh, all the net job growth over, since 1977 has been uh, due uh, for those startup companies. But, but right now, right for, the now last, for the last several years, the startup rate in the US has been essentially flat. So if that startup rate has been flat, and our larger established companies have been laying off people and outsourcing, uh, then that's going to uh, negatively affect uh, our job growth here. But venture capital firms, venture capital backed firms are in fact the most efficient uh, in those that are the more efficient, that's just a general 
small startup company in generating job growth. About eight times more jobs are generated through companies that gain venture capital. And then when those companies, some of those, some of those companies go into the public sphere, become uh, public companies, go through an initial public offering, then 92% of a company's growth happens after it gets that financing to become a public company. Uh, so this is really important thinking through the dynamics of how job growth happens in the U.S. And then we're going to, I'm going to start talking a little bit about the difference between uh, some of the internet jobs versus manufacturing related jobs. So here we have some existing companies, Sony, market value 35 billion, 170,000 employees around the world. Boeing, how many of you partner with Boeing in some way? Do we have any partner? Yep, amazing company. $50 billion market value and number of employees, 157,000. Now Facebook, which is getting all the, uh, the media buzz, obviously, with 500 million users. Or no, I'm sorry, that's old. I think it's up to 750 already. Uh, I heard that the other day. Market value, maybe about 50 billion. Uh, it hasn't, they haven't gone through an initial public offering yet. Does anyone have any idea how many employees actually work for, for Facebook? 500? It's, it's, it's astoundingly low. Maybe 1,500, 1,700. So job, and right now there is an internet, maybe not, a, maybe bubble, not a bubble, that's a negative word, but there's an internet boom happening, particularly in Silicon Valley. A lot of companies are doing some amazing uh, work with cloud computing and systems that really ease the friction of doing business. Uh, uh, and I utilize a lot of those, so I don't want to speak negatively on those at all because they're really great for helping small startup businesses be more effective and act more like big businesses. But they don't typically generate a lot of jobs. Real job growth tends to happen more uh, through, through innovations that then require uh, large-scale uh, manufacturing. So some economists have called the, the decade of the 2000s the lost decade. Uh, certain technologies that got a lot of buzz at the beginning of the decade, particularly microelectromechanical micro systems and gene therapies, we had done the human genome uh, mapping at the end of uh, the 1990s, were expected to create all kind of new products and, and technologies that would roll out during the 2000s. For the most part, that did not happen. We had Google and we had uh, some you know, internet software cloud computing uh, phenomenons, phenomenons. But, not so but not so much an actual commercialization of these very uh, important high-tech breakthroughs. It doesn't mean they won't happen. Often the, the technology curve, there's a delay, a significant delay beyond what people would like to see happen and what actually happens. So uh, for America's competitiveness, we're going to have to be able to commercialize these kind of discoveries and then turn those into, into widespread job producers. Another piece of this lost decade is the idea of the industrial commons. Um, you know, I was a big fan of Thomas Friedman's analysis of the world is flat. Uh, which some people have talked about, he was kind of a globalization booster, that everything about globalization is good. Lots of people coming into the middle class, lots of wealth created, except for com com countries like ours where we lost a, a lot of employment uh, throughout the process. Uh, we were really living in a mirage during the 2000s, 2000s based. based on our borrowing against the uh, kind of mythological value of our houses going up. And, and all that fell apart, and it, the underlying uh, remains of that have been really, really negative. Uh, so we didn't see that we were in a lost when decade. We were in the lost decade. But with the industrial commons, what's being discovered, and these are uh, uh, a piece written by Gary Pisano with Harvard Business School economists there, is that we've lost uh, manufacturing capabilities here in the U.S. for desktops, for hard disk drives. Uh, we're at risk of losing our uh, capabilities in manufacturing blade servers, mobile handsets, things of that sort here in the U.S. And um, inevitably, there's a tension. When production goes somewhere, there's a tension, there's a tension of, of where do you put the design and the engineering. And the globalization uh, mindset that Friedman uh, promoted, and many economists do promote, is that the U.S. can be simply a hub of design and engineering, and the production can be offshored, and we'll somehow be fine with that. 
What's, been, what's happening, though, is eventually that tension can't be resisted. Uh, AMD uh, has actually moved many of their design uh, capabilities, as well as their chief technology or information officer, to China. Uh, China's China. government, in many of the negotiation and agreements that it insists upon, is that intellectual property moves with the production. And it's really a challenge to protect intellectual property, to protect uh, uh, the, design. the design capability. Uh, so I'm starting to come to the conclusion, and it's echoed by, by the work of Pisano here, is that if we, that eventually we will lose complete capability, like this, shows this a, shows a couple year old version of the Kindle that can no longer be produced here in the U.S. Uh, we don't have the capability, we don't have the industrial commons, and by commons it means that shared space of intellectual talent uh, production capability that you need to have a, a, a cluster of a particular technology. Uh, our innovation has our innovation capacity in the U.S. based on uh, one of these organizations that rated it had slipped during the decade of the 2000s to number six. Uh, that's on the left column there, and on the right column you see that our actually rate of increase was the lowest of all of the countries that were surveyed during that decade. So this is the innovation ecosystem uh, identified by Bill. Uh, all at of, of MIT Centers for Engineering and he looks at all the pieces that have to be in place so there is no quick fix there's no one-size-fits-all but there are a number of factors that go into creating sustaining a positive uh, innovation ecosystem one is the government has to have the right rules regulations tax policy uh, second, we have to have the demand with either internal to a domestic economy or global demand for the product and service, uh, demand of supply chain companies. Third is uh, the invention capacity. So universities, I was just talking with Glenn at the, at the uh, Dell Innovation Labs, so that internal corporate R&D capacity. Uh, and then we also have the kind of the open source innovation uh, movement that has sprung up with, with internet technologies over the last several years. The, the funding capacity from debt and equity, that's the venture capital and the uh, initial public offerings to bring uh, funding into the corporation. Uh, the physical uh, infrastructure, both physical and service infrastructure that supports innovation. The entrepreneurs themselves having a, a supply of people with entrepreneurial talent, with technical talent, uh, and then networking those entrepreneurs together so that they're working, sharing ideas. Uh, and then the culture. And many, the culture needs to be one that, that, that uh, supports individual achievement and also is very tolerant of failure, failure actually, or actually failure. almost celebrating failure. And that's the, all of these have been the hallmark of the U.S. innovation system for many years. But as we'll see here, there are some real uh, dangers ahead. And this book has not gotten a lot of play. I kind of ran into this somewhat serendipitously about two months ago um, with Henry Notoff, who's based here in, in the Valley area, as uh, a lead, his CEO of a company called Cicera that makes, uh, does a lot of MEMS research and development. Um, and I heard him give a podcast with the Harvard Business Review's uh, daily or weekly podcast. And I went to the bookstore in Washington, D.C. the other day, and I searched and searched and did not see this book on the shelves at the bookstore at Union Station. Uh, that's unfortunate, because I think that the messages that are in this are really, are really important. And uh, he's not paying me to say this, but I would highly recommend that you get on Amazon and order yourself a copy or go, or go find a copy of this, this book. I find it really, really helpful. So his basic warning is that we didn't understand that a nation that no longer makes things will eventually forget how to invent them. Manufacturing. Manufacturing, Manufacturing clearly has benefits to society. Uh, there's the, the uh, backwards uh, uh, benefits of driving demand for mining and construction. There's the forward benefits of driving demand for warehousing, transportation, wholesale and retail trade. Uh, the National Association of Manufacturers estimates in one of its studies from a couple years ago that for every good, for every dollar that you invest to actual direct manufacturing capacity, there's a dollar forty-three cents of residual benefit to the region, to the local economy, out of that. 
Uh, so we, we really have to ask ourselves fundamentally as a nation, do we have the right policies that are encouraging, encouraging manu manufacturing? manufacturing? So here are some issues that I was not aware of and I wanted to share we with you. A, we have major a major logjam in the U.S. patent system. Right now the average patent, uh, it's a completely self-funded system. You pay $38,000 to file a patent application. Have, have any of you filed patents in this room? Congratulations. I, you could probably come up and give us a seminar about the patent system. Um, it takes an average of three, over three and a half years right now. It's supposed to be an 18-month turnaround. There's such a backlog of about 1.2 million uh, patents that have been backlogged. Part of the problem is that even though it's a self-funded system, some of those funds have been being diverted to, right, other, to government. other government purposes, such as running the U.S. Census. So, I know. That's government. Um, so what should be the hallmark of our uh, R&D system in the U.S. is getting divert diverted. Uh, and what's so important about patents is uh, back in 1958, uh, research was done that showed that everything prior to 1958, every significant invention in the U.S. economy, the zipper, the, ze the jet engine, the television, uh, helicopters, cellophane, air conditioning, were all developed by small companies. And, and inventors who were doing uh, work more or less on their own. And if a small company, uh, a, small in, a small company inventor doesn't have a patent protection, then they can get worn down and grinded into the dust by large companies and their legions of lawyers. So it's, this is fundamental to the U.S. system. is actually one of, the, one of the things that was in the U.S. Constitution. So if people ever argue about what's the role of government, this is absolutely the role of government, uh, to create a system that protects exclusive the exclusive right uh, to their re respective writings and discoveries for authors and inven inventors. And the fact that we have a system that is completely backlogged and dysfunctional just amazes me with all the talk about getting back to the fundamental principles of the Constitution, and we're not getting this right. So this is uh, the, the fundamental piece that has to be fixed as soon as possible. Secondly is the issue of the venture capital breakdown. Uh, for Somewhat for the patent reasons, the, the, the fact that we have this amazing backlog of patents Piece. And venture capitalists, by and it's the right thing to do, they're in to make money. And so if they're working in an environment uh, that is not favorable to large-scale investments for domestic manufacturing, they are actively encouraging manufacturing to happen in other places. Uh, and that's not, that's not their, fault. their fault. It's really policy, it's really government's fault that that's the, the, the ecosystem that we've allowed to develop doesn't actually encourage domestic manufacturing of high-skill, high-tech products. And Novalite is a company uh, here in the Silicon Here's Valley area that makes a thing called Silicon Inc. And it allows a dramatic breakthrough in the quality, the efficiency of solar energy production. Uh, they could not get venture capital funding to create a large-scale manufacturing presence here in the U.S. So they had to completely change their business model. Rather than being a developer and a manufacturer, they now license their technology to solar manufacturers in China and to Japan. And uh, I know I've read two articles in the last two weeks of U.S. domestic solar uh, plants that are shutting down and outsourcing the jobs. Uh, so companies like Innova Light, because of the... The, not so much the patent issue, but because of the venture capital um, uh, conditions right now, could not uh, do their domestic manufacturing that they wanted to do. Here's another company, A123. People have heard of A123, right? Any, any, let me see some hands. A few. They've created breakthrough battery technology, which is already being used in power, uh, power tools and also is very important to the electric, uh, electrification of cars in the U.S. Uh, this uh, uh, Yet Meng Cheng, the MIT professor who created this technology is a Chinese immigrant, says this is an American technology developed by Americans. We should be building it in the U.S. 
Uh, but for his first couple years, the venture capital community said, no, we will not fund you to manufacture, manufacture here in the U.S. You have to manufacture uh, in China. So they set up three plants in China. Fortunately, the stimulus funds did give them the incentive and the and the, the, created the right economic conditions where they've set up a plant in Livonia, Michigan, uh, which is a critical piece uh, for helping Michigan particularly about manufacturing in general. So, you know, the question I've always asked is what, what about the patriotism, patriotism of these U.S. companies? We have all these great CEOs who are very accomplished, and I've worked with a few of them, and I've certainly studied a lot of case studies in my MBA world. Um, it, it always perplexed me. Well, Legally, and, and uh, Notoff talks about this, legally they are required to do what's in the best interest of their shareholders. They are not looking out for the interests of the U.S. That's the private enterprise system. They are responsible to make the best economic decisions for their shareholders. Who is in charge of looking out for all of us as citizens, as the shareholders of the United States? It's our state and our national governments. And if our state and national gov government leaders don't get that, we can't blame CEOs and corporate interests for doing what's in the, the company's interest. So a couple other things that are playing into this. Sarbanes-Oxley uh, was the, you know, the kind of the, the fix to fix all fixes that came out of the downfall of the Enron and of WorldCom scandals, uh, in, immense public accounting responsibilities that don't really distinguish between large enterprises and startup smaller enterprises. Uh, the, the requirements of starting, uh, starting going, going from a private company to a public company now are about $3 million of accounting work and preparation. So if you are a small company, you have to get to a certain, a pretty high level. Now the, the estimate is you have to get to somewhere to $100 million to $250 million of revenue to make sense to turn into a public company when you have to spend all that work just to get your accounting and then to have that ongoing accounting happen. Uh, it used to be that companies could go public at about 30 to $50 million of revenue. Now what's really important is that 93% of the job growth happens after they get that public financing, after they expand. So we've got this log jam of companies that are getting to, on the verge where they could really benefit and scale up from, from that public, uh, being a public company. They can't do that with the, the accounting rules the way they are now. Tax policy. Uh, during the decade of the 2000s, 27 of our competitor countries reduced their corporate tax rates, but the U.S. stayed at 35 percent. So now our corporate tax rates are about 35 percent. Most of our competitors are down in the 20s. Again, it's not the only thing that matters, but it's part of the puzzle. Uh, research and development, tax credits, we're being... Uh, our, our competitor nations are offering somewhere 47 to 50 percent tax credit for every dollar you invest as a company in research and development abroad. The U.S. tax credit is about 15 about 15 percent. And it's on and off depending on whether Congress can get its act together. So again, <laughs> I'm sorry. I used to work there. I, I, I get to love them and, and disparage them at the same time. Um, so this is... If we did, get a did, consistent tax credit that was a little closer to the international norm, some estimates say that that extra research and development and then the job growth that would happen from that could generate 160,000 jobs. Another estimate was somewhere around 500,000 jobs. So the, the research and development piece, it sounds arcane, but that is the key to breakthrough technologies that then can scale up and create uh, domestic jobs. So. What Notoff said in his summary statement was that we need a willingness to distinguish between the big corporate giants that need to be regulated and the small entrepreneur startups that need to be liberated. So this is a summary of his uh, recommendations from Great Again. Uh, extra money to help the patent office get its backlog, backlog taken care of, reducing the corporate tax rate, uh, creating U.S. Uh, manufacturing incentives. That's one thing I didn't really get into, but China and India, India and Singapore, Singapore they, they just are really making it a very welcoming place to set up a manufacturing enterprise. And the U.S. system, for the most part, is very far behind. One bright spot, anyone here from New York? Uh, okay, good. New York, just recently in upstate New York, through, through state incentives, 
uh, just set up a new uh, joint venture with AMD and a, a, a foreign firm uh, to create a, a major new chip manufacturing plant. The first one that's been built in the U.S. in a number of years. Uh, the silicon chip manufacturing industry, you know, it's, it's, it's U.S. invention, and yet we've seen very little happening there. This, this just happened last week. The Kauffman Foundation, uh, which is based in, I think, Kansas City, uh, uh, but very strong in promoting business entrepreneurship, uh, sent up to Capitol Hill a uh, thing they call the Startup Act. And it reflects many of the things in NOTAS recommendations. Uh, so I, I, it got a f somewhat favorable re uh, reception from uh, Majority Leader uh, Eric Cantor. Uh, so that's, that was hopeful. They had a bipartisan, well, had a bipartisan uh, review or, or discussion of the, of the act. It hasn't been introduced yet, but with any luck, after we get through whatever this is going to look like in terms of resolving our debt crisis, hopefully our leaders will start to think about what's actually going to create jobs that will help us generate the revenue uh, so we, we can start to dig out of our debt hole. So the need for leadership. Does anyone recognize this? The American people Please always do the right thing. Thing. After they've tried every other alternative. <laughs> Winston Churchill, I think, had it right, because right now in Washington, they're eliminating all the other alternatives. And hopefully, they will figure out the right thing uh, for, for our overall budget, but then particularly for job creation. So this is the recap. We need government policies that support innovation, and we need, for you as educators, understanding that for the innovation eco ecosystem to work, you, our schools and, schools and colleges and technical colleges need to be developing people that can work in the business startup, the finance, the sales, the manufacturing, the technicians. I know this group here is particularly focused on the technicians, which is uh, invaluable. Uh, but, but we also have to make sure that we're, we're thinking holistically about what that ecosystem needs. So some bright spots. Now we get to talk about the good stuff. There actually is a movement of onshoring and reshoring, of moving some manufacturing back to the US. And because the, the cost of Chinese wages has been going up 12% a year, uh, it, one estimate is that by the year 2015, a Chinese wage will be on average about 69% of what a US wage looks like. Uh, so that, that dynamic is changing pretty quickly. And then other things come into play. Shipping costs have gone up because of fuel prices. Intellectual property, uh, as we already discussed, is not well enforced over in China. Um, there's sometimes very inconsistent quality controls. Um, it's really important to connect engineering with uh, production so that you can improve quality and troubleshoot things and solve things quickly. And then even from a personal side, uh, US managers complain about having to make 11 PM phone calls and midnight phone calls to talk to the manufacturing side over in China. So there are some, there are dynamics, some dynamics that are starting to play where the best choice is not always offshoring or outsourcing. And so uh, General Electric brought back uh, its, its energy efficient water heater production to the US. Uh, we have Ford Motor Company that brought back about two jobs that were in Japan and Mexico and India. Uh, 300, uh, 250 jobs with, with NCR for building ATMs have been moved into Columbus, Georgia. So I don't, on the aggregate, I still think the offshoring component is beating out the onshoring, but it's still a positive trend. And then, why don't you give yourself a round of applause here. <laughs> I, I think that the ATE centers are really the unsung hero of producing a technically skilled workforce. It's an amazing program and system that's developed over the last 20 years. Uh, so we don't have time to go through every one of these. But when I look through uh, the, impact the impact book and look at all the pieces that you're creating and the fact that your budget, the budget is surviving amidst such uh, hell with every other budget in the country, uh, that there's, there's an understanding of the importance of the work you're doing, of, of producing the, this qualified workers for, for the innovation economy. Some other positives, many of you are probably working with FIRST Robotics. Project Lead the Way, programs that have grown ex uh, extremely quickly, have a lot of coverage, 
and a lot of general popularity with both educators and with the business community to build uh, those pre-engineering concepts into young people in the high school level, even down to the middle school level. There's another, There's program. another program called El Engineering is Elementary. Anyone working with that at your local level? Yeah, so here we are, we're building engineering concepts and thinking, design thinking into our elementary schools. Uh, so there's, we've got a lot of the infrastructure components in place to, to build that technically skilled workforce for the future. Uh, another piece, the maker tinkerer movement. Uh, you'll see Make Magazine, Wired Magazine had an a, a article documenting how that kind of crowdsourcing capability that gave us Wikipedia and gave us um, Firefox browser, all those pieces are coming together in the, the idea of tech labs or, tech, or fab labs where you can bring together all this fabrication equipment and in almost like a club mentality, mentality have people going and tinkering. It's really kind of the, the Wright brothers on steroids, bringing them back together, getting people working with their hands and working with the technology to create innovations for the future. So that's a really positive movement that's happening. Uh, we had the manufacturing skills certification system that was rolled out officially maybe four or five months ago, but it's been in the works for years and years. So this, again, is another great component of building that in, uh, infrastructure for innovation. Uh, and then about a month ago, uh, the president announced this advanced manufacturing partnership, uh, $500 million of federal funds uh, to support advancements in research, uh, for high-powered batteries, advanced composites, metal fab, biomanufacturing, uh, molecular research on manufacturing, next generation robotics, and uh, reducing the energy used in manufacturing. And a number of, of prominent U.S. companies and prominent U.S. universities are part of this uh, manufacturing partnership. So I feel like, frankly, I feel like the Obama administration does get it. Uh, I think that they understand that manufacturing, high-tech, high-skilled high tech, high manufacturing is, is absolutely the way of the future for the U.S., and that they're trying to move uh, the discussion in that direction. Um, another positive thing is that flying under their popular radar is, uh, this is from Wired Magazine in June of this year, are these emerging epicenters of innovation in the U.S. There are, uh, you know, Silicon Valley probably gets all the press, and then we have, you know, Dallas with a, uh, or, the, or the Austin region with some of its IT uh, work. But all over the country, here we have some example. We have in Provo, uh, Utah, software development. Uh, we have in uh, Fort Collins, green technology. We have in Waco, Texas, I'm just gonna shout out to Cord here, uh, maintenance aviation, avionics and dispatch, uh, Bloomington, Minnesota, medical devices, Reading, Pennsylvania, batteries, Spartansburg, South Carolina, polymers. So there are these innovation sectors that, are, that are, are springing up all over the country. And if you go to Wired Magazine and find this chart, it gives you the, all the color codes, and there's about maybe 40 different uh, innovation sectors that they identified through national data. Another really positive are state-based venture funds. Uh, this is the one I'm gonna talk about, Texas. Now Texas, uh, how many Texans do we have here? Yeah, right. Don't mess with Texas because they're doing something right. They've uh, about of about all the jobs that have been created in the last year, half of them more or less have been in, uh, created in Texas. Uh, and and I talked to a woman in, I know in the governor's office who runs this technology fund, and they are very they are very loath to give all the credit to this technology fund. They believe that their overall business environment, uh, it's a little more difficult to file lawsuits and, follow, and to profit from uh, lawsuits that don't have any validity. Um, you know, lower tax, I guess they don't have any corporate taxes, uh, state taxes. So there's a lot of things that build a positive business environment in Texas, been but they've been some some doing interesting some. things because this is a state with a governor who talked about seceding from the union and so you would think that you know, that mentality is that government shouldn't be doing anything. Now maybe he thinks that about the federal government, but at the state government level, they've, been, they've created their, a state level innovation uh, venture capital fund, $259 million, that they're using to invest in partnerships uh, with the goal of, you know, of if, basically if it's discovered in Texas, they want to commercialize it in Texas so that the job growth and the benefit happens in Texas.
I guess I lost something there. Let me go back. Okay. Yeah. So here we have uh, basically three and a half million is on the high end, but most of these investments are one to one and a half million. Uh, social networking, cancer vaccine, biomarkers, nanomolecular molecular cancer therapeutics, a whole range of really fascinating technologies. Each of the small companies that companies receives, that the, receives venture the venture capital funding has to be in partnership with the university, and then they also have to get some private matching funds. So it's a very creative way of doing this. And I know Ohio is doing something similar. Uh, and I'm sure a few other states are. So, so it really does kind of break the mold of what, how can government be more proactively investing in building that innovation infrastructure. Of course, and then the last thing I wanted to share with positive you. is that um, everyone's getting in the act to try to change and create positive role models. And here, here is high-tech Barbie, and she has her computer, and she's an engineer. So, you know, we really want to get everyone involved here. So here are the bright spots, the recap. We've got reshoring and onshoring. We've got investments in the ATE centers and other type of pre-engineering robotics programs. We have this culture shift for tinkering and making. Uh, we, we're an emphasis from the federal government on the manufacturing infrastructure. And then we have state level innovation investments. The federal government has also been making some investments in energy through a new energy uh, research fund. Um, so. Uh, trends in the U.S. workforce. This will be quick. Uh, I just wanted to, many of you may have seen this report called Help Wanted. Uh, it just kind of reinforces what we already know to be true, that in the future, in the future number of years, about 30% of, of new jobs and replacement jobs are going to be jobs that require uh, some college or an associate's degree, and about 33% will be jobs that require a bachelor's degree. Uh, so we have it, the whole idea of college for all m mentality that uh, really infuses almost all of K-12 education doesn't line up with the reality of the job market. We'll need about 22 million more people that have an associate, bachelor's, or graduate degree, about 4.5 million workers that have a post-secondary certificate. So based on the current college going and uh, whether it be technical two-year colleges or four-year colleges, we're going to miss the mark at about three million. So there will be this continuing tension in our workforce of having sk some skilled jobs available and not having uh, the workers that we need. The other thing that this report points out is that even though the, on average uh, you still earn you know, significantly more over a lifetime for a professional degree or a master's degree versus uh, some college or high school graduates or high school dropouts. You know, it's a significant difference. But the reality, 27% of young workers that have a license or certificate earn more than those with a bachelor's degree. And we all know that anecdotally, but that's the number. 27% of people with licenses or certificates earn more than, someone, than the, those with a bachelor's degree. 31% of people with associate's degree earn more than those with a bachelor's degree. So that's the, so that's data, the that, data that proves that what you're doing at the two-year college, the technical college system, uh, is incredibly important. The last the thing I want to just to be aware of is what Daniel Pink called the free agent nation, that about 33 million Americans are working in a very non-traditional environment, either as a soloist, as a temp, or in a small micro business. So as you're thinking about the kind of future that you're preparing your people for, they may be working in a very small entrepreneurial environment. And that's something uh, as educators to really keep in mind. So post-secondary education is needed for most workers. Uh, there's a wide variety of options. Uh, parents and parents particularly and the general public need to understand that but a lot of your 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 technicians, technicians your, your training may work in very small environments they need to understand uh, the the dynamics and the expectations of that and particularly as we're thinking about uh, the startup nation mentality is uh, what are you doing to encourage your people to think about uh, being entrepreneurs themselves Skills and knowledge, we've got a skills mismatch. Basically, what I'll just say here uh, is that jobs change. And somehow, um, American companies have gotten, through, gotten the through the recession by having the same output, economic output, and eliminating a lot of jobs. So that if somebody is a, loses a job, four months later, 
that job doesn't really exist anymore. It's morphed through technology and through different processes. processes. So that's part of what we're experiencing. We have three million job openings in the U.S. right now where employers can't find people with the right skill set uh, because, uh, because they're, they're either not, they don't exist at all or they're, they're in a different part of the country. Maybe they're locked down in a underwater mortgage. Maybe they're in a two-income uh, two family and the one spouse doesn't want to move. Uh, so there are many reasons for that skills mismatch, but part of it is that jobs themselves are continuing to change. Uh, U.S. jobs in general are becoming more complex. It's been a 30-year trend that expert thinking and complex communication skills are going up, and routine manual, routine, uh, non-routine manual skills are going down. Uh, so this is just the reality of, of the workplace that, that whatever manufacturing resurgence we have is going to be much more automated, much more driven by technology than, than the old style uh, manufacturing. Um, one thing for you as, as educators just to consider is that when employers are asked about the skill sets that they're looking for, um, they're asked, this is a survey, I'm going to go and bring all these up here. Essentially, no matter whether they're you're talking about employees that just came out of high school or employees that came out of a two-year college or a four-year degree, they're looking for professionalism, they're work looking for teamwork and collaboration, for oral communication, for critical thinking, for ethics. Um, and if our programs only have technical skills and don't actually focus on those things that can get an employee hired or fired, then we are, we're not really producing, really producing work-ready work uh, students. So these are critical pieces that employers are telling us they, they need. Okay. Pavement, so time. pavement time. Where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> okay, here's the question. Is the solution liberal big government? The belief that government creates jobs and solves all our problems? Is the solution far right, really small, or almost no government? The belief that if government just gets out of the way, that the markets will take care of everything. So this is my opinion, my opinion is that the solution is smart government. We need, we need realistic decisions about spending and revenues and how those balance out but we need strategic investments. We need to encourage real job growth by backing off the regulations and taxes, particularly of the startup phase companies, uh, make smart investments in innovation and manufacturing, and then uh, supporting education and training uh, as is being done through the ATE program, but through all of our community college systems and our career technical high school programs, that those are the pieces of the solution, the solution that, will really that will really lead to us a healthy uh, innovation ecosystem. So what can you do in your business partnerships? I talked to, talk to a few people that are involved here in the ATE system and the healer, is that the right way to say it, from the Convergence Center. And here's what she said. They created an industry leadership team, not an advisory team, which is basically rubber stamp. Uh, we bring together, she brings together leaders to give real input and to shape the direction of their program. And it takes about eight weeks and about 100 hours of intensive outreach to form your ILCs. Uh, she holds regular conference calls with, I believe, 70 to 100 members who are involved with this. And what they do there, they don't just talk about what the pro project's doing. They talk about trends in the industry so that the peers in that, in industry. that industry can learn from each other uh, and hear what's happening. And it really builds a strong sense of needing to be there. Uh, th and they focus on building a pipeline of qualified workers so that all the business partners see what's in it for me. Deborah, uh, Deborah Boisvert with the Baytech. Uh, she and I talked on the phone a while back. And one interesting thing she told me is that after the internet, first internet bubble burst uh, at the end of 2000, uh, they, you know, they were certainly worried about the future of the Baytech project, but they realized at that point that IT was really infusing all of American industry. It wasn't just the, the kind of the high visibility uh, startups that, that kind of crashed and burned. So they moved their, their emphasis to the infusion of IT across industry, 
they really captured this idea that professional skills were just as important as the technical skills. And they developed uh, what they called a life cycle map. Some of you have probably heard of this. Uh, that, that any cycle of technology has an emerging technology side of it. It has a growth phase, it has a mainstream phase, and it has a commodity phase. And when technology gets to the, gets commo to the commodity phase, like VCR repair guy, you know, no one repairs VCRs as far as I can tell. Uh, so that's not the kind of job you want to be training for. So they try to position all their programs in that mainstream and that growth. They know that the emerging technology is probably really more the domain of the university research programs, but they want to position themselves in the correct place. Kathleen Bowman from Anne Arundel, they've done a lot of work in creating a regional STEM commission, uh, working with uh, the defense industry in that region and the high-tech industry to forecast, particularly where cybersecurity is going. Uh, and then this advisory committee doesn't actually report to one program. It's very strategic on a regional basis. And then they use the information from that committee to help them shape the specific directions of pieces of what they're doing at Anne Arundel Community College. And then uh, the South Carolina Advanced Technological Education Program, uh, they do a DACUM, uh, developing a curriculum review of all their programs at least every three years to make sure everything's very current. Uh, and one thing I thought was fascinating was that they've created to help their help students, their get, students through the get through those really difficult entry-level gateway classes. They've created a very integrated curriculum that uses problems uh, and, and um, inquiry-based approaches so that students can develop their academic foundational skills in the context of an industry area that they've already been interested in. Uh, and then they, they also use work uh, classroom scenarios to create workplace scenarios so that if, if all those uh, professional, professional skills, those, skills those 21st century skills are so important, we have to figure out real ways to make sure every student gets it as opposed just to one student that might take an internship or a job shadow. Uh, we have to think about scalability of developing all those skills. So the key steps here uh, is doing, bringing together economic development, employment, and education little by little when you get those three to a place of synergy, that's where you get that alignment of uh, the innovation economy. So I would encourage you to pay attention to your innovation clusters in your region. Uh, th these are some more hints, but basically follow those hints that we just heard about from those four examples of being serious about engaging your business partners. Advisory committees will not give you a dynamic program. It won't get you the buy-in you need. It also won't give you any information that you need. Uh, so you have to be very thoughtful and proactive about connecting your local business partners to what you're, to doing. What you're doing uh, at the regional level. So ask yourself, excuse me, what can I do to explain this innovation ecosystem to the people I interact with? Uh, and particularly your business partners. Get them a copy of that book. Uh, get them thinking and discussing with you about how these broad policies impact job creation and then what you can do to more effectively connect to that. Ask what can I do to ensure that my program addresses all of these skill sets that employers say are important. And then ask yourself what can I do to engage my business partners more actively. Robert Kennedy said that none of us can change history by ourselves. Each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of all those acts will be written the history of this generation. So back to my original point, it is very tough to save the world all by yourself. And I know each of you are coming to this conference so that you can drive, uh, der derive energy. Derive energy and focus and new ideas to help you be more effective. Even Superman learned this lesson. <laughs> he learned that saving the world is a team sport. So with that, I say go team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Um, as I close my year as chair of high tech, I want to thank everyone again who helped make this conference sail. I won't take the time to announce all of those people again because we've already done that. 
but please know that it's a wonderful community to work within because there's never a lack of people willing to step up to the plate and do some of the work. I'm gonna uh, diverge just a slight little bit here and I'm going to ask two of my students that I tra trained in the 1990s to stand up. Jeff and Julie, this is quick, this is quick. Okay. They are faculty members. They've actually followed me at every community college where I've actually worked. And they are faculty members at all these colleges. But I got to train them in the first networking program in the whole state of Texas that was vendor specific. And the way we delivered it and the way we defended it was that it got people really, really good jobs. So they were teachers. And then in the mid to late 90s, they had a student whose name was Jeremy Christian. Jeremy Christian, please stand up. Jeremy Christian is also Jeremy Christian Behealer, my child. He would never listen to anything from me. <laughs> However, he did listen to them, and we had him codenamed by his middle name because I wasn't quite sure how he would act. And since I was the chair of the program, I didn't want him to have to live in my shadow at the time, for good or worse. Anyway, this is what makes a difference. This is what, why we do what we do. I helped educate them, they helped educate him, and he just flew in last night from Alaska where he's working in a tech support job um, in Anchorage, Alaska. So thank you very much. And before you clap, one other quick thing. Carl Behealer, will you stand up? This is my husband, he came in last night, and he's the one who puts up with me and lets me go off and chase the rainbows in the sky. So. I know that took a minute of your time, but I, it was really important for me to do that. Okay, you are the superheroes. You, I could, you couldn't have played into my closing remarks better. I thank all of you. You are the ones that are making a difference. The business people that came, the faculty, the staff, the students, the grant staff, anybody who came to this is here for love, for passion, for making a difference in this world. You're making a difference for the students, and when you make a difference for the students, you're also making a difference in the future lives of their families, and therefore enabling their families in future generations to be successful. When you get tired, and I'm sure you get tired, and you wonder if it's worth it for the hours that you do for the pay or lack of pay that you receive, you're always pursuing the next new thing because we're in technology. I mean, we're not in Middle Eastern history of the, you know, the year 200 or whatever. We're not in something that's relatively static. Every year we have to learn new things. So when you get tired of this, please remember that it is worth it. And you have colleagues also striving for the same thing. It does take a team. I hope you have a safe travel going back to wherever you came from or are going to, and I look forward to seeing you next year. Before I get down from the podium, though, I want to introduce the chair for the next year's high tech. Deb, would you come on up here? This is Deb Newberry. Yay! <laughs> Drum roll, I'm turning it over. It's been a joy there, it really has. Deb is from Dakota County Technical College and the Nanolink Center that's based Minnesota. in Minnesota. Deb has years and years of corporate experience as well as eight years at the college and three years in Nanolink. She is going to do a fabulous, fabulous job, job <laughs> and she is gonna tell you a little bit about our next high tech in Denver. Yes. Thank Go for you, it. thank you. First, let's just thank Ann so much for everything that you've done and all of your work. Thank you, Ann, very, very much. Well, it's a pleasure. Go high tech. And as Ann mentioned, we're going to be in Denver next year. And I have just a few That's, charts um, that I hope we can go through. One is that there are 160 nonstop flights into Denver International Airport. I want you all to be aware of that. Hopefully we won't have uh, ground struggles. 26 is the number of miles that the Denver airport is from the conference site, which is the Marriott Hotel in the Denver Tech Center. 
1,257 is the number of feet that you need to walk to get to the Wallace Park, which is um, located very close to the hotel, obviously. And there's running and walking and bicycling. It's a very nice area of uh, southeastern uh, part of Denver. We've got the mountains. You know, here for, for us, we could uh, connect with our ocean uh, spirits out here in San Francisco. And next year, we get to associate with our, uh, relate to our mountainous spirits. 20 is the number of restaurants that are within 0.35 miles of the hotel. Lots of very nice restaurants within easy walking distance. Lots of good food. Uh, five, let's see, what was that? Minutes to the Denver Light Rail. If you take the hotel and just go over the bridge, you're at the Denver Light Rail. You can go north or south. Very nice uh, light rail system for you. What does that say? Zero. Ah. <laughs> Number of other conferences that are going to be at the hotel, the Marriott Hotel. We get the whole hotel. They want us. They love us. And uh, I think it's going to be absolutely outstanding. It's a nice uh, Marriott Hotel. The elk symbol. And uh, we get the bar all to ourselves, pretty much. <laughs> Also, one thing that I especially liked about the Denver area is I would like to have uh, the ATE program as well as us, us ATE center folks and community college people take advantage of four-year institutions. And we've got the University of Denver, we've got the University of Colorado, both the Colorado, uh, Boulder, Colorado site and the Denver site. Lots of uh, four-year research type institutions. There's Lots and lots of aerospace and biotech companies in that area. Uh, Lockheed Martin, one of our sponsors now, is also very prominent in the Denver area. We've got Ball Aerospace, Raytheon, Seeker, lots of smaller electronic aerospace and biotech companies. And then finally, we've got the um, National Renewable Energy Laboratory that's up in Boulder. So I think it's going to be a very, a very exciting location that we can leverage into four-year institutions and also leverage our connections with industry. So with that, I invite you all to join me in the Mile High City a year from now, same week, the 23rd through the 25th of July, the same period. And to announcements logistically, fill out, please, the forms. Deb Newberry at dakotacountytechnicalcollege.edu if you want to volunteer, if you have suggestions, changes, thoughts, whatever, but fill out the evaluation forms. Downstairs, 115, the last prize drawing in the uh, technology showcase area. Thank you all very, very much.